It's the most wonderful time of the year. All the way home I'll be warm. Hi, I'm Danielle. And I'm Gabriella. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the transcript. transcript. This week, the transcript explores women in music, goes swimming with Hamped Up, sets records with NHS students, discovers the Baha'i community in East Hampton, looks into an animal rights group in Northampton, and journeys to the wild to research the elusive vapor. Hi, I'm Willa Sipple. And I'm Serafina Foreman. Welcome to Tell It Like It Is. Female musicians across genres face setbacks because of their gender. From a young age, girls are sometimes not as well respected in the music industry as their male counterparts. Western Mass is unique in having an abundant female music scene, so we wanted to take a look at the women artists in the area. We sat down with Hannah Mohan, lead singer and guitarist in indie rock band and the kids native to Northampton, to find out how she's dealt with inequality in her career. I think it's important for women to have their own space to play music because if you go into a room with a bunch of guys playing music, it's just like there's just a not an inclusive atmosphere. We were opening for a bigger band and we kind of knew that their crowd was like, like rockers, you know, we were like, oh, but they're good guys, like we like opening for them. So were, I think their fans had like never seen maybe all girls play together. For women to grow in music, they need their own space to like, to feel confident, not feel like held down, and like they have other people to work with. I think that's really important. To take a look at the female music scene within Northampton High School, we sat down with a few students of different genres to see how they made music. I've done a few gigs. Um, I did one like 45 minutes away in Vermont, and I've done a few open mics around the area. And generally, people have been so nice and supportive. Well, definitely at Brat Rock, the festival that I was a part of, it was super male-dominated, only a few other female acts. It was just like mostly bands who were all male, which is really surprising to me. The thing that you have to do, especially in like band, is um, you, you just can't let people push you around. And like, I don't let that happen. And music shouldn't be. It's like something that connects people. It shouldn't be something that divide so. In middle school band there was a level of sexism that was hard to deal with. Jazz in particular was, is even more male dominated and um, that's why we had our all-female jazz band for a short period of time. We traveled up to the Institute of Musical Arts, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting women in music, to speak with their director Ann Hackler. It's really important for girls and women to have a space that they can begin to build their own um, musical language in some ways. There's, I think that there's a way that, not to make gross stereotypes, but there's a way that men and boys are more comfortable taking up space than girls are and women. We started IMA over 30 years ago because there was nothing, I mean nothing, for women and girls in music at that time period. Getting girls on the gear is really important, and I think it really does change a lot of things. And the earlier, the better. And the kids will have a new album coming out on February 22nd. Make sure to support your local musicians. Thanks for watching. This was Tell It Like It Is. Hi, I'm Lulu. Welcome to Hamped Up, and happy winter sports season. Y'all ready for this? The 
offseason had the swim team in a bit of a panic due to the absence of a coach, causing the team to train without the guidance of a formal coaching figure. Despite the absence of a coach, the swimmers diligently prepared for the season and are eager to get into the water. After now recently hiring a coach, the team is more than ready for this upcoming season and is excited to see what the season has to offer. I sat down with seniors Asa Geller and Brendan and Liam McBride to discuss their preseason preparations and their senior season expectations. One challenging thing if we didn't have a coach was um, the captains were going to run practice, which would have been a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of like... Um, time out of the pool? Yeah. A few members of the team, I guess, went looking for a coach before the season. Uh, luckily, we got one who's really experienced, so we're all set now. Well, one thing that's unique about swimming is that it's very individual based as opposed to um, like a team sport, although we are very, there's, it's a big community. And it's collaborative. Even though, yeah, it's still collaborative. Like as a team, we're pretty close, especially because we have a really small team. And also like we go day in and day out, like it's a lot of work in the pool and I feel like we bond over that. Okay. Yeah, the practices are really hard and we all struggle together. Yeah, I'd like to get, like we had five people go to states last year and I'd like to get at least three this year. Yeah, we want to bring everyone to Western Mass and we want to bring a relay to states. Congrats to all the fall athletes on a great season and good luck to all the winter athletes starting their seasons this week. Thanks for watching Hamped Up, I'm Lulu Kesson. Hi, I'm Gabe. Welcome to After the Bell, the show where we explore the lives of NHS students after the bell. Have you ever woken up and thought, I'm going to set a world record today? Well, juniors Caleb Zuckerman and Asa Thompson sure did. They broke the record of most consecutive frisbee throws, a record previously held by an individual named Brody Smith. He has a YouTube channel where he posts frisbee trick shot videos, as well as the most epic proposal ever and girlfriend made me try her Diablo sauce. Also, apparently he's quitting frisbee. The previous record was held at 521 consecutive frisbee throws, and our very own Caleb and Asa doubled the record with 1,043 consecutive frisbee throws. I sat down with them to learn more about what goes into beating a world record. One, two, three, go. So the world record that we were trying to beat was most consecutive frisbee throws between a pair with no drops um, from a 10-foot distance. The current record is 521. Well, I think it's just like a fun thing to do in your spare time. Um, both Caleb and I do a lot of frisbee, so we figured, you know, might as well get a cool title. So as we were doing it, for me personally, uh, it kind of got into a rhythm. Um, you know, we've done this so many times, we've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours doing it, so it was kind of just a rhythm that we got into. I was really tired when we were throwing, honestly, <laughs> and I lost focus many times, but after I felt so happy, I mean just that, the fact that we were able to set a world record, even something that was easy to do like that, it was still really satisfying. Um, when we hit 520, I was terrified because I was the one who was supposed to catch 521 and I was so scared I was about to drop it. I was kind of just ready to spike the disc and be done with it so I could get rid of this. One hour later. 1,039, 1,040, 1,041, 1,042, 1,043. There is a good chance that could be in the book, but at the very least, um, they will put our names on a big plaque. It's a lot harder than it seems. Actually, the application process takes a very long time. I think Asa put in our application around three months ago and we're just being able to do it now. And then it takes another at least six weeks until they confirm if it's valid or not. Uh, but I would definitely say go for it. I mean, it's a lot of fun and you get to say you hold the world record, so. Pick something that you're good at and that you feel is feasible. Um, just do a little research and then uh, send in your application. Wow, Frisbee really is all that. Make sure to tune in next week for more fun escapades. Hi, I'm Amelia Tamayo. November is coming to an end, and tomorrow on the 1st of December, you can buy ski and skate equipment at Smith Vogue. In other news...
The Baha'i Faith is a relatively modern religion that teaches the worth of all religions, focusing on the unity and equality of people. This week we joined the Baha'i community of the Pioneer Valley for their Art and Spirit devotional gathering at the Flywheel in East Hampton. We sat down with members of the faith to understand more about the Baha'i struggle for acceptance, their roots, and their beliefs. So the Bab was born in Iran in 1819. The Baha'u'llah actually was born two years prior to that in Iran, but it was the Bab, we, we call him the gate. He's like the doorway. We compare him to John the Baptist. Sometimes he prepared the way. He, uh, in private, he, in, on May 23rd, 1844, in private, he met with a man whom we call Mullah Hussein, who was the first to hear his message. And after actually 18 people had sought the Bab out on their own, and he had told them of his miss mission, then they went and began to share it with the people. Also, the equality of men and women. We have a saying that men and women are like the two wings of a bird. And if one wing is not as strong as the other wing, the bird won't be able to fly. So the advancement of women is important, and having the voices of women included is important. We wanted to know if NHS students knew anything about the Baha'i Faith community, so we took to the halls to find out. Have you ever heard of the Baha'i Faith community? No. I have not. I have not. No. No, I have not. <laughs> no. What's your religion? I am of the Jewish faith. I'm Catholic. I'm atheist. I'm Christian. My religion is, I am considered atheist, but I do have some spirituality with the Buddhist th the faith. Atheist, but I went to Catholic school. Thanks for watching. I'm Amelia Tamayo, and this was In Other News. Bye! Hi, I'm Alexa, and welcome to The Leftovers. Activism takes many forms, whether that's boycotting, marching, or simply just spreading the word. Members of the animal rights organization, Anonymous for the Voiceless, have taken to the streets of Northampton to spread awareness about animal cruelty through street activism. We sat down with a member of this group to better understand this type of advocacy. So Anonymous for the Voiceless is an international nonprofit organization that is um, set on spreading awareness to the public about where their food comes from and how that food impacts the lives of others. So we do receive a decent amount of backlash. Um, I would say for the most part, the overwhelming majority of the time, it's really positive. Um, we do have people yell some derogatory things at us, call us names, all of that, but we try to treat them with the same compassion that we're preaching towards um, the animals because humans are animals and we think that all animals deserve kindness and compassion. Um, but with that being said, majority of the time people are super excited that we're there and, and thankful that we're there, which is really nice to see because um, a lot of the times a lot of people have never seen this stuff before and we're just giving them the outlet to uh, learn things for themselves and uh, most of the time they're very appreciative and really shocked too is another big thing. It's a, the shock factor is really big and uh, productive for us and for the animals as well. When I started doing this, I really thought that people were gonna be like, whoa, whoa, this is too intense for me. But it's, I've actually found it's the opposite of that. People want to know where their food comes from and they want to know the process in which it takes to get there. A lot of people don't want to and that's okay. They're just not ready to hear the message yet. But for the most part, the people that are, um, that do want to know about what we're talking about, they come and they stay and they talk and, and a lot of the times they don't make that change that minute or that day or in the next year. But the way that we look at it is if we plant a seed maybe years down the road or days down the road, they decide to make a change into a vegan lifestyle. We spoke with some of our fellow peers to better understand their experience with this type of activism. It uh, depends on how you feel and, um, and emotionally react to animals and their life. I went vegan like a little over a year ago and so far it's been like interesting for me to see how I adapted and 
I did it for like the environment and for animals um, and not so much for my health. Like with different socioeconomic situations, a lot of people don't have the ability to be like vegetarian or vegan. It can kind of hurt the cause when you try and like force it on other people who aren't like ready to like start having that as a lifestyle. So I think that can hurt a little bit, but I think the intentions are really good. Anonymous for the Voiceless has held over 9,500 demonstrations around the world, providing support and help for their bystanders. For more information about this organization, visit their website, anonymousforthevoiceless.org, or take a look at one of their next protests downtown. Hey -oh. Welcome to the other stuff. There is a new rising trend amongst middle and high schoolers known as vaping. This unhealthy trend involves a battery-powered device that vaporizes a viscous liquid called e-juice. E-juice, or vape juice, is a mixture of vegetable glycerin, propyl glycol, flavoring agents, and nicotine. One of the most popular vaping devices is called a Juul. A Juul is a small and sleek vape that resembles a flash drive and contains a more concentrated amount of nicotine than cigarettes. Because of this recent appeal that Juul has made on high schools around the U.S., the FDA has started to heavily regulate the sale of e-cigarettes and most recently took fruity Juul pods off the shelves and forced Juul to delete all of their social media accounts, limiting the exposure that high schoolers have to the Juul. Although the wild vapor can be found in any park or dark alley, they usually are spotted sulking by the navy blue stalls of the second floor bathroom. These mysterious creatures find comfort in the dark corners of the school, far from the reach of their relentless predators. Fueled by jewel pods and Red Bull, these animals are often tense and irritable. Approaching them in the wild is very dangerous. You can identify the wild vapor by the faint stench of mango, a light sprinkle of Cheeto dust on their fingers, and the sound of Takashi 69. common predator is the custodian. These predators will often venture into the vapor's natural habitat in hope of catching the mischievous prey. Run. Vapors have one of the most advanced senses of smell in the animal kingdom. Their senses match those of greyhounds and elephants. Vapors can often smell when there is a jewel pot in their vicinity. The more we explore this invasive species, the more we can hope to understand how it came to be in our animal kingdom and how we as a people can create a better society in which this animal is no longer tolerated. This was Planet Earth Vape Edition. Thanks for watching. And be sure to be on the lookout for Felix, our friendly Tasmanian devil mascot, who will be making his way around the school. To be entered for your chance to win an NHS t-shirt, post a picture with Felix to Instagram and Twitter with the hashtag GeoFriends and Felix. For rules and more information, visit www.locatethendonate.com. Good luck! <laughs>